the last thing I'll say about interactivity is really looking at the games industry. So there are many books now on game design, many degree programs that exist uh, around the country. Very, very effective programs to teach basic game design that create these engaging experiences. Now, of course, a lot of times games are built with entertainment in mind, but now we see games for change, we see games for health, we see course games for learning. And so I won't go over all of this list, but I will tell you that looking at a game design book, um, Tracy Fullerton's from USC is an excellent one. Uh, Jesse Shell has an excellent book. These will help you understand how to craft experiences that matter and that draw people in. And uh, you will sometimes hear the phrase gamification. It's not one I, I use very often, um, but it is the it shares a goal of creating a system of rewards, a system of feedback that manage that learner's um, or that player's emotions from moment to moment. And again, it doesn't always have to be happy. Sometimes games can be very frustrating and that can be to the game designer's benefit. So really in the end, what we're talking about is experience management. Uh, how can a system very carefully make changes that keep that player or learner engaged, interested, curious, um, spark future interest. And uh, this is a picture of Minecraft, which I'm doing a lot of work now with Minecraft and teaching basic concepts of astronomy. Uh, what would happen if the world were different? If we had no moon, the tides would change and animal behaviors would be radically different. The atmosphere would change. So I'm working with Neil Cummins at the University of Maine, a, a famous astronomer, and thinking about not just telling kids about what the world could be like if there were different uh, cosmic circumstances, but letting them actually experience it and maybe even define it themselves, which is at the heart of Minecraft, which is modding, making the system what you want it to be. Okay, so our final category of orchestration tactics is to introduce narrative. And uh, this is the oldest form, and I won't pretend to be a narrative scientist, uh, but I will share a few examples with you, including the work of a good friend of mine. First thing I want to show you, though, is that narrative has a long history in museums. Um, and this is actually uh, just an hour away in Springfield. My son and I, who you could probably pick out my son from Lincoln's family there, uh, we went to the Lincoln Museum. Uh, I've been as a kid. Uh, it's a fantastic museum. Um, but you see the, the Lincoln family as they are approaching the, the White House. And so uh, there are three sons. What's great about the museum is they have this traditional form of conveying Lincoln's story. But as you work around the museum, there are highly interactive, technology-driven exhibits that really augment the story. They don't overpower or distract you. They really do complement uh, Lincoln's amazing life and help you come to understand him better. Now, Ada and Grace, I'll go back to them. Ada and Grace were actually not just characters that we created that talked to you. Uh, a long process went into defining their personalities, their history. So they are not just look the same, they actually can tell you who was born first. They argue about it. They have different interests and in when you ask who are your, do you have a boyfriend, they will tell you they have different interests. Uh, one is very interested in, she wants a, a guy who's involved in uh, amino acid sequences and the other just wants one who's thoughtful and kind. And so they bicker like twins do. Uh, they can tell you when they were born, uh, when they were compiled at USC and then copied over to Boston. Uh, so the point of all this is when you create a character like this, it's not just enough to write what they will say, but to think thoroughly through where they come from, why they're there, what they like, what they don't like, and to give them, um, give them background. And that is the story. That's the role of narrative. Uh, so pushing it even further, uh, so as I, oh, if we think about the twins and Lincoln, wouldn't it be amazing to actually go talk to Lincoln and ask him the questions personally rather than be told them? So that's the vision and creating interactive historical characters is, is a part of the work at USC as well. So moving on to now Star Trek, The Next Generation, one of my favorite shows growing up. You may recognize where Commander Riker is in this scene. Uh, he's in the holodeck, a completely fabricated uh, world uh, in a large room, digitally uh, recreated but tangible and interactive. 
And so what they do on, on Star Trek was use the holodeck for training, for vacation, uh, sometimes to uh, recreate uh, historical scenes, you know, just to, you know, as a way to teach and learn from them. So this has been the inspiration for so much educational technology. And what you'll notice when you watch the show is that it's not just the fact that you could do all of this, that you could recreate these scenes, but it was very interactive. So it was all story driven and that really sends the signal of it's not really the technology, it's the story, it's the experience. And Star Trek did a wonderful job of communicating that, that important idea that is often lost. Um, if you've seen, most people have an opinion on a terrible movie that had really good special effects. And so this is the exact situation. The special effects can only take you so far. Um, they can't make up for a weak story, and that's true for educational content too. And so uh, stepping back now to more current work rather than uh, a fictional future like Star Trek, I want to refer to work from um, a former colleague of mine from USC, uh, Mark Riddell at Georgia Tech. And Mark works in something called automated story directing, also known as interactive storytelling. And what this is, is it's, it's a way to tell stories that, think of uh, choose your own adventure, but on steroids with heavy duty AI planning machinery behind the scenes that can do, this is a snapshot from one of Mark's talks, that can allow you to go in and change the story by taking actions. And then the system can readapt, create new branches for you, even as his latest work and work your way through a story. And if you ruin the story, and if you look at some of this very carefully, you can, you can see there are plans in place in case terrible things happen in the story. If you ruin the storyline right away, the system adapts and restructures it all. And uh, that's the idea, is, is that you're going in and you might break the story, but uh, the system can fix it and put you back on a narrative path. So these interactive storytelling systems are very powerful and hold amazing potential to communicate stories, communicate lessons learned, and actually, if, if you ever did a choose your own adventure, you probably have kept your thumb on an earlier page. Oh, I made the wrong call, I'm going back. I certainly did that, uh, but that's learning, right? You made the wrong choice. Okay, here's why I'm gonna go back and try a different choice. So Mark's work is, is like that, but uh, very much beyond uh, branching storylines. As I wrap up, I wanna leave you uh, with this reminder that when we do all of this orchestration, when we think about these ideal learner states, I mean, the ultimate idea is to think about what's gonna last. And so it's, it's always important to think about what that original definition of orchestration said. What are your desired effects? What are you hoping to achieve? Uh, the National Science Foundation uh, here in the US likes to talk about in informal learning awareness, uh, gaining knowledge, maybe not as deep a knowledge that you can get from say an eight hour school day, uh, but you can still certainly gain knowledge in a short visit to a museum. Uh, creating interest, uh, looking at behavior change. If you do an exhibit on health and dietary behaviors, maybe you can trigger something that in improves the choices people make in terms of diet and exercise. Do you want them to care about a problem? Uh, do you want them to go pursue more knowledge later? So these are all very important goals that informal educators seek, and I would argue that formal educators seek as well, um, uh, with teachers inventing all sorts of novel ways to teach subjects. Uh, it's often in service of interest or creating motivation uh, and, and or inspiration to pursue uh, knowledge later. I, I also want to cite research from a completely different field um, as evidence for why emotions really matter in learning. Uh, there's something in behavioral economics called the peak end rule. And it's a very simple idea. It's that when you have an experience it is, there are two things that really lead to long-term memory of it, and especially long-term positive memory of it. It is the, if, say it's a painful experience, you will remember it's a combination of the highest point of pain uh, combined with the last bit of time. So if you have something that's very painful, but you add a few seconds or maybe a minute of non-painful experience at the end, that's, you will remember it as being less painful overall, the peak end rule. And so if we think about that as educators, if we want to end an educational experience on a really positive note, that could have a profound impact on how learning cumulative effect over time. If your learning is always ends on a positive, 
Uh, this is the sort of thing museums can do. They can bring in a lot of positive emotions to learning, which we hope would bleed over into formal institutions as well. The second thing I want to point out is this idea of challenge and difficulty. There is amazing basic research on learning and memory uh, attributed to uh, Bob Bjork at the University of uh, California, Los Angeles, and uh, Elizabeth Bjork and many others who have looked at this idea of a desirable difficulty. So these are the things that make learning harder. And so our instincts as, an, as independent learners are often to not seek out difficulty, but rather to seek out performance. So we want to feel like we're successful. So if you're a tennis player, you might just stand in one spot and hit forehand after forehand, and you start to see that you're getting better. It's actually better for you to run around the court, hit backhands, forehands, volleys, overheads. Now your performance won't be as good. You'll make more errors, but that difficulty introducing those challenges leads to longer and better retention of those skills. And that has been tested across the board in cognitive and motor skills. And so museums and any educational situation, frankly, can leverage these ideas to really have that lasting impact. So I'll leave you with this one almost shocking fact uh, that in the United States, there are more museums uh, than Starbucks and McDonald's combined. This is a Washington Post article. You can check it yourself. But when we think about that fact and we think about how these, these are institutions that are there purely to help us learn, uh, we should be inspired ourselves to go to them and to go look at them critically but also positively and think about the impact they're having on society. Hopefully our friend leaves that museum happy. This is the Indianapolis Children's Museum, one of my favorite places on earth. And these ideas can combine together. And I think the way I think about technology, and I hope that I've convinced you to think about it, is, is it can really amplify and improve everything we do already and everything humans are good at. Uh, but we just have to do it right.